ready to keep you company wherever you are. Card Blanche, the podcast, brings you immersive, hard-hitting stories anytime, anywhere, every week. We hope you survived the Rugby World Cup finals weekend and that you're ready for another episode of the Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche. Here's what's coming your way today. The ANC wants to call it quits on partnering with the EFF. The latest Brenthurst survey predicts some interesting 2023 elections outcomes. There is no alternative, especially for black people who make up majority of our country, not because the ANC is such a great party, just because it's a trust deficit with other political parties. Then the AGOA Forum kicks off this week and the SA Music Awards in limbo. But first, Aaron Bates and Queen and Maswabi look at the Springboks' unforgettable Rugby World Cup journey and how it's inspired a nation. Let's get into it. We're starting off about the Rugby World Cup final. South Africans are quite excited, but the rest of the world hates us. <laughs> I mean, I think... Don't those, say it, don't say it, it's not true. It's so true because all those last-minute wins do nothing for our popularity. Most teams who played with us actually believed that they won at some point. At the very last minute, the Springboks always come back with so much fire. And I believe that they really play for South Africans. They really play for us. It's true, I think, what you say about the Springboks really playing for the country. Seeing videos of people cheering for Elizabeth, of course they mean Eben Etzebet. Seeing, for example, the Mnet advert with the Springboks speaking so deeply about who they're playing for. You get that sense of what's driving the squad and the kind of philosophy of the Springboks when they hit the grass. I completely agree with you, Erin. I think it is kind of becoming a unity tool for South Africa. I mean, we always unite through sport, but I think this time around, it's quite evident that we're all on the same page as South Africans. The fraught ANC-EFF coalition is on shaky ground, as the ruling party makes it clear it no longer believes its partnership with the Red Berets is beneficial. From calling the EFF out on questionable ties to criminal figures to outright calling the EFF a proto-fascist party run dictatorially, it seems the ANC has already made up its mind. Of course, we're ramping up ahead of the election next year. You've published a really interesting piece on Daily Maverick about the ANC and its thinking around coalitions. Tell me a little bit more about the document that was the basis for your piece. So David Makura has been handling coalitions in terms of forming a framework for the ANC particularly because they've been working off of just gentleman agreements and nothing more. So the ANC wanted to formalize the way in which they coordinate their coalitions. And with that, there's been a coalition document. The document drawn up by Makura assesses their partnership with the EFF. And it says that the EFF is not a good coalition partner and that they need to go back to the drawing board and pull out of these coalitions and sit on the opposition benches instead. It seems as if they are aware of certain issues behind the scenes. They're not really specific about when they talk about the EFF's lack of good governance. Basically, the document just outlines why the EFF is not a good coalition partner. I also thought this quote from that document from David Makura gave me pause. The view of the EFF as being, quote, embedded in corrupt practices and links with criminal business syndicates such as the cigarette mafia, which it publicly defended. But one cannot help but think about the ANC's own very elaborate links with criminal networks and what's come out of, for example, the Zondo Commission or parliamentary inquiries. So interesting that the ANC has such a high bar when it comes to partnering with people outside its party. I think it's outrageous for the ANC to even take that line because they should be the last one speaking. However, I do think it's a tactical decision because they are now seeing how the EFF is capitalizing off of the positions that they do have. Not many of them, but they do have positions and they've been pushing their agenda ever since they did get these positions. And it's through the ANC. The ANC is realizing that the EFF is indirectly benefiting from all of this. And remember, in Ekurleni, they have been at loggerheads with the ANC, the very same ANC they're working with. 
They've been fighting with over small issues in the municipality, but obviously there are cracks in this coalition already. So by them cutting ties with the EFF, I do think it is beneficial to a certain extent, although it might really piss off the rest of the coalition partners. I think this kind of reporting in the build-up to the national election next year is so important because you start to get an understanding of the existing machinations around coalitions that are happening at a city level or a metro level, let's say. And it's also important in terms of the jostling for power. So if you get into a partnership as the ANC with the EFF and the EFF leverages that partnership to gain traction and ground and maneuver strategically, that's kind of part of the recipe. In terms of what happens next, what happens to Makura's document and will there be a follow-up report? Does it get escalated? How does this proposed position on coalitions with the EFF and PA move forward? This is going to be taken to the coalition task team of the ANC. They will strategize around how to pull out of the coalition. This decision then will be taken to the National Working Committee of the ANC. They will give recommendations. And thereafter, at the last NEC, at the end of this year, a final decision will be made. Last week, the Electoral Commission of South Africa formally launched the 2024 National and Provincial Elections Programme. But if the latest Brenthurst Foundation survey is anything to go by, we're in for some interesting outcomes, most notably the very real possibility of a national coalition. Let's look a little further into research around political sympathies amongst the voting population based on some really interesting research that's come from the Brenthurst Foundation working with Sabi Strategy. What stands out for you? Definitely the ANC's decline. From the last time, they said the ANC would have 47% of the vote. And now that's gone to 41%. And also that the multi-party charter would reach 36% based on the latest numbers. But also positive growth for the EFF as they'll move from 11% to 17%. Also just possibilities of coalitions, who the ANC should work with, how that would look. They do come up with a number of scenarios. If the ANC is dropping to 41%, it means that they will have to cozy up to parties that are part of the multi-party charter now because they won't be able to work with smaller parties. I mean, interesting, if you consider what was in that ANC document around coalitions and the 20% or just below 20% prediction around the EFF support and then to see this number. I mean, it's clear coalitions are on the cards in some way, shape and form. The mystery is how they will come about how they will be configured and ultimately how they will function. Something I thought quite interesting coming out of that report was the discussion around the IFP, the role of the IFP potentially beefing up the ANC's numbers and edging it closer to 50%. And according to the Brenthurst Foundation analysis, even above it in the event of a low turnout, there was a time in South Africa when the prospect of the ANC and the IFP working together was inconceivable. I interviewed Belinkosini Sabisa, the leader of the IFP, a couple Mm. of weeks ago. And what he said was that they are open to having discussions with the ANC. They've always been open to having discussions around reconciliation of some form. But the IFP's concern is that they will not be usurped by the ANC at any point. They want to be a party on their own. And because their numbers have been increasing in the last couple of elections, they see hope of yet again being in charge of KZN and also being possibly the third highest political party in the upcoming elections. So because they are improving their numbers. There's no way I think they want to be used by any other party. However, what's been interesting throughout is that the ANC in its internal documents mentioning how they need to make sure that they have a good relationship with the Royal House, the Zulu Nation, and also having a good relationship with the IFP. But little strides have been taken in terms of the IFP. 
sort of zooming out of party sympathies, they found that 83% of the South Africans they surveyed ranked unemployment, corruption, load shedding and crime as the most important issues facing the country. And 57% hold the ANC government responsible for South Africa's problems up from 51% a year ago. Also noting that the ongoing energy crisis and the collapse of infrastructure is a real issue. And they believe that based on that, no single party is close to reaching the 50% threshold. So we're really on the brink of a massive change in national governance because we've been in single party rule for a very long time. The ANC at their last NEC, I could see something I haven't seen in a while when it comes to the governing party, which was unity. They are very focused on fixing issues because elections are coming up. President Phil Ramaphosa even mentioned the fact that this was one of the best NECs that they had because they were not arguing factions. It was about the battle of ideas. Well, the now battle. they're in a corner, Queen, and it's not about who yes. is in the ANC zoo. It's about how do we cling on to power. If they do focus, they can achieve quite a bit and make it seem as if they've been working hard throughout the last five years. And I think that traps voters every single time. Also, something that Kalima Mutlante brought up last year at his foundation event was that there is no alternative, especially for Black people who make up majority of our country, not because the NC is such a great party, just because it's a trust deficit with other political parties. Set to take place from the 2nd to the 4th of November, there's a lot riding on the much-anticipated AGOA Forum happening in Johannesburg. With South Africa already walking a diplomatic tightrope in relation to its stance on the Russia-Ukraine war and, more recently, the ongoing Israel-Gaza crisis, our continued participation in this highly beneficial trade program faces uncertainty. Queen Anne walks us through some of the biggest talking points. So next is AGOA and the AGOA Forum at the beginning of November. This springboarding out of the controversy around Lady R and Ambassador Ruben Brigitte's allegations on its cargo. What can we look forward to and keep an eye on with the forum? In terms of South Africa, South Africa and Africa are trying to position themselves as a manufacturing hub. So South Africa is moving away from being the exporter of raw materials only and want to show that we also can produce the final product. And this is based off of what happened during COVID-19. Africa was in a bad situation because we didn't have the infrastructure and the resources to produce our own vaccines. And because of that, we were in a position where we had to wait on other countries' availability of vaccines. I mean, that was just one example of why Africa and South Africa needs to move to a different kind of realm when it comes to importing and exporting. But we also expect that there will be a lot of businesses trying to get onto the forum because it gives businesses the opportunity to trade at a certain level and not pay the levy. We will see a lot of our businesses on display trying to show what South Africa has to offer. But sadly for the media, just like the BRICS Summit, we will only be covering the opening and the closing. There are Mm. no other open sessions. So as a media, if you are covering it, we're going to be working overtime trying to find out what they're saying in these meetings. I thought the other interesting thing in terms of AGOA and the upcoming conference, just reflecting back on Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to South Africa in September last year, recalling the comments of Minister Naledi Pandor of international relations and corporations around steel. And she, in their address at Durko's headquarters in Pretoria, really lobbying for relief from some of the prohibitions against steel imports into America. So clearly tariffs are going to be an important theme in the forum coming up. I think that Minister Pandor has really held South Africa's name up high. She's been very clear about what we need as a country, and also making sure that we don't come into any situation just as the underdog, because that's been the case Mm -hmm. with Africa for many years. And I see a change in how South Africa, our international relations department and the presidency has been handling these issues. And I can say that definitely there will be a conversation around this. 
It's been called a polarizing decision as the KZN government abruptly backtracked on its promise to fund this year's Glitzy South African Music Awards or SAMAS. Carrying a hefty price tag of around 20 million rands, this about turn leaves organizers with just over two weeks to make alternative arrangements. And while some might say it's a win for taxpayers, others say it's a devastating blow to an already struggling music industry. So the basis of this obviously is that News24 article which reports that the polarizing, as it's quoted as being SA Music Awards or SAMAs for 2023 have been called off, uh, confirmed by the KwaZulu-Natal government. News24 had exclusively disclosed that President Cyril Ramaphosa advised against it with a 20 million rand price tag. His spokesperson, Vince Maguena, then pushed back against that framing of it and said that uh, he may have suggested it not go ahead, but uh, he does not get involved in the day-to-day running of provincial departments. I am extremely disappointed. I do believe that artists in our country are really just not supported enough. But more importantly, I feel like our music industry right now is at its peak. And we see a lot of our artists are in America, they're in the UK. There's a huge demand for South African artists and South African music, particularly the genre of Ama Piano. Mm. And I think it's very disheartening for artists to find out that the only place where they can have bragging rights, there's a possibility that it won't happen because our government is pulling out. And now I know South Africa, we have issues as South Africa, there's no trading. We have so many issues as a country, but I feel sometimes our issues overtake what could possibly make sense for our country. Mm. And for each and every artist that's been working hard throughout this year, gigging all over the world, getting awards in other countries, it would be very disheartening for our own country not to make sure that the awards move forward, even if it is that they're not donating the full amount. I'm not saying donate all our money, but can government step in once for artists? Because I have a huge problem with how this matter was handled. And I think that government could have reached a compromise, at least. It's a difficult balancing act, of course. You know, a big glitzy event that celebrates musical talent and skill really in a perfect world could happen and there would be funds available and it wouldn't be an issue. But I do wonder how much it is also the tip of the iceberg, that more systemic issues, that the way government supports the creative industries is not done systematically and consistently for the benefit of the workers in those fields. I remember years ago when I was doing my journalism postgraduate degree, I did a special piece on arts funding in the Department of Arts and Culture as it was then. And because it's kind of seen as a side ministry, Sometimes ministers get relegated to arts and culture and sports to keep them out of trouble or keep them from looting or doing more damage in more serious departments. There really are ongoing demands and needs for support for arts and culture in South Africa. And this seems to be just one casualty of a systemic issue. I really wish that we had major backers for our arts industry. It's even alarming to know that other countries are holding music festivals with our artists. We have not had a major Amapiano music festival. Other countries are capitalizing off of that, but it's because there's backing. And I know a lot of people will talk about whether we trust the ANC to handle that money properly. You know, it's a lot of money getting out of the state coffers for the summer awards. I think it's unfortunate that we need to stress about corruption all the time. Even with the the music festival and the award ceremony for our amazing artists. So, Queen, we have to we have to pivot this into a green shoot. And how we're going to do that is. I'm going to tell you who one of my favorite local... Okay, I'll give you two, actually, Mm because I'm so inspired. I'll give you two of my favorite local artists, and then you give me one or even two of yours, and we'll have to use that as our gray shoot to green shoot close-up for this podcast. So two of my favorite local artists, Sun L Musician, who I have seen live, and is incredible, and just has such a palette of musical taste and talent, and is so good in building up an atmosphere and a, a mood 
food and just drawing in different rhythms and melodies and has such skill and presence. And then the other one is Cuesta. The first time I saw his music video for Spirit, I just started weeping because it was such a South African sound. The shots in that music video were of like gassy life, but done with such respect and so beautifully. I think he's an amazing musician. So those are my two, who are yours? I will stick with Gabza the Small. I mm. think he's such a brilliant artist all round. He's brought such a great element into our music industry. I believe that his work has, I think, carried South Africans throughout the lockdown. That's when his work started being known by everyone and he started gaining popularity. All around good producer and artist. Hands down, Gabza the Small. Yeah. I'll say honorary mention to Uncle Waffles. Um, <laughs> I, I know people hate on her a lot, but I can say that what her brand has done for our music industry is quite amazing and we see it. I do think we need to acknowledge her in this era in our music industry. Well, there's our little mini summers, a nod to some incredible local talents. And I think as green a shoot as we're going to get, Queen, and it's been an absolute joy talking with you. Thanks, Erin. It was great. And that's a wrap. In case you missed any of our previous chats with Daily Maverick, you can find them all on Carte Blanche, the podcast available on Spotify and all major podcasting platforms.